Yo, don't you find that everything is just so curated these days? I'm so self-conscious trying to figure out what to say because I'm worried about retaining an audience, retaining your attention. But for the sense of everything being some sort of commercial, how can I just speak frankly? I have no influence. I have no following, really. So why would I even speak? A friend of mine was like, what are you even talking about? Like, if you were doing anything good, I would tell you. That actually stung. But uh, maybe I'm just being a little bit of a pussy about it. And maybe he's right. Depends on where you're looking from. But I'd say he's about right because the marketplace shows. I mean, the yeah, like the fact that I just lost my train of thought makes things seem a little bit strange. And I could talk about something sensational or what I really want to talk about or what I think the world needs to hear. So let's just choose one. I think the world needs to hear that. Uh, basically, I think we are way too blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. That's like everyone else is saying. This, this, that, 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 this, boo, boo, boo. So basically, I think there's not much to talk about. That's how I feel a lot of the times. And uh, maybe the best way to approach the situation is to simply get very specific on one thing that I wrote down in my journal. How about that? Let's talk about healing and spirituality healing healing what is healing can mean you know you injured yourself you hurt yourself you got a bone problem and then or a muscle ache and you gotta give it time to heal it'll naturally heal and it'll leave some scar tissue and then you might have to get some massages or emotional healing somebody broke your heart i think the difference between a physical and emotional healing is they're both connected, but the physical, like you cut, you got a cut, like, like I lost my toe. I had it got amputated and stitched up and it just healed on its own. I just had to take care of it in terms of not letting it get infected, but it didn't matter what so much what I was going through emotionally or what I was thinking or how spiritual I was. Let's, yeah, let's just say, but then, oh, if you're a really good spiritual huckster salesman, you can convince people that they can heal faster. Their cuts heal faster. That was one of Osho's stories, or was it Sadhguru? He said he's, he was able to heal his broken arm really quickly. And everyone was so surprised. Miracle stories. So people want to be spiritual so that they can heal themselves faster, so they can heal others, so they can be some sort of Jesus, Messiah, so they can be special. I just back to the, my main point all the time is spirituality awakening is not special. And then I'm sitting here making a podcast about how it's not special, and yet by making a podcast, am I trying to be special? I could connect to that sense. And it could be interpreted very easily that I'm trying to be special. But what if I just say, hey, I'm actually just trying to help people save time like every other business or save their ego from getting caught in spiritual ego, from getting completely absorbed in some sort of chase for superpowers. I mean, martial arts, meditation, it's all part of some hacking productivity coaching program leveling up thing now these days and it's almost to a point where you can't really fight it you can resist it or just play with it but i'm i'm reminded right now of the sense of the old school yogis or the old school masters of some martial arts so they would they had these powers that would help you achieve in some way to help you improve life protect others but these powers were very powerful and if you had ego it would be used for your ego it could purpose it like the dark side so they had to choose or they had to humble their students to a point where they had no ego so then they could be bestowed with these powers but in this day and age there's no humility in this process so everyone's actually to me majority 90 percent I, I don't know the exact number but the sense is that it's all about your spiritual ego, even when you say it's not. And it's using business. Like these gurus that people love, they were, they were businessmen. And they were teaching the teachings to anybody and charging and building businesses. They're, they're trying to be rich and have a lot, build their life, man. They're powerful. And it wasn't just about being spiritually awakened. 
It was about power. Yogi Bhajan, Osho, they had power. I mean, relative to somebody that, who also had power, like Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist monk. I mean, he has a lot of, I think the, if you get popular in any way, then you build an organization. The people within that are going to create their own thing about it. So like him and Muji, these guys that got popular, they all have acolytes and that's a whole nother thing. Like how, how spiritual were you today? How good are you? Same in, in Asia and Taiwan, I see with these big Buddhist organizations. It's all about, and each one has its thing, but there's one called Tsuji, which is about service. And it becomes like, how much service did you do? It becomes a badge of honor, achievement. And you get shamed if you're not, you know, or you, you get status if you're better. You get awards. It's it's very, I want it's, it's just, it's very, it is what it is. But I, I just think, I'll put something out there today saying, hey, if you can see that it's actually increasing your sense of self, it's keeping you in the matrix, it's keeping you in competition, it's keeping you trying to prove yourself, trying to achieve something, you're transferring your financial achievement or scholarly achievement ideas to something spiritual. And I speak from my own experience as well. I got my yoga certification 2000, well, 10, 12 years ago, 500 hour. I, I even have degrees, bachelors. I didn't pursue more, but I think that we, tr we tend to trust people with certification. And like, it's like, how can we trust people? How do you know? And part of it is an intuition that I think is gone from our society and culture. We trust the wrong things. That's such a broad statement, but I mean, anyways, uh, spirituality, awakening, healing. The main idea here is that the healing doesn't have to be spiritual. And the spiritual doesn't have to be healing. Why? How? For example, some people have spiritual awakenings when they're dying, or they're near death, or they're in a very painful situation. They're not sitting there meditating on a rice field on a mountaintop, yoga music playing, and they have an awakening. They're freaking dying. They're crushed between something, they're broken something, or they're caught underwater and about to drown. These are moments people have awakenings. So it doesn't have to be the whole yogi vegan retreat and then wearing white. Like, all oh, that's fluff, man. Or you don't need it. And you're healing and you're spiritual. It's so much of a show that you have to just see it as a show or else you'll go crazy trying to think, oh, I want these people to be more authentic, more real. It's sad. Now, do I have an ego about it? I could or I couldn't. Depends on how you look at it and how attached you are to it. Am I saying it how it is? I think it comes down to people's basic ideas of reality and assumptions they make about things. And if you look deeper, it's... And if you can be honest with yourself, you can see that there is a sense of self that you gain from being this or that. And if you don't gain a sense of self and it's just about profit, then that's maybe that's more spiritual than anything. <laughs> if you can just see it like you're convincing people that they're getting more enlightened, they feel like they've... You're getting value and you're doing your job and that's all that matters. It doesn't matter that you're just putting them more into delusion and they're keeping them as a customer and back to the whole capitalistic system, modern. And then you blame Big Pharma, but you're doing the same thing. You want them to keep coming back. And I'm just going to keep talking about this forever because I have no life. It's easier to talk about the inconsistencies than it is to just play the game, isn't it? But if I don't play the game, then how am I going to survive? And what I mean by that is I want my, my body to work. I want to feel healthy. Like you can be spiritual and awakened, live off like, like basically that's what I did. Lived off an allowance the last 10 years. Didn't really try to, I mean, it didn't really improve my living conditions. Live in a developing country. You know, I thought that was fine because I was getting spiritual. But now that somehow you can call me spoiled, but I feel I want to take care of my body and my mind. And it requires more of a sense of a home, a sense of a place I can breathe and feel healthy and get the nutrition I need. And plus, before I wanted to surf. Now I still do. But now it, the reality is I'm not willing to sacrifice so much of my health to surf. Not only that, I don't have the energy if I do that. I don't have the energy 
to surf like before. So I need more restful sleep and a home. But now it's challenging because everything's more expensive. It's more crowded. The air quality is bad. The f air so the surfing life is, is like a distant memory. It's like a dream that I'm trying to hold on to. Meanwhile, I have a surf injury that I'm trying to nurse back in a... Uh, yeah, some context. I'm sitting here in the middle of the hotel in Kuala Lumpur, looking out at some skyscrapers, seeing the development, feeling the energy of, you know, I think I'm only reason I'm talking is because I have this equipment and I said I need to do something, which is kind of selfish in itself. And yet I want to do something and I want to help people. And I can help people by telling you my experiences of wasting my life so that you don't waste yours. That I, uh, I have low self-esteem because I don't think anyone ever listens. And it seems like I'm not willing to do the work to make myself more pizzazz. So, but I am willing to do the work of just keep talking when I have the energy. Like, this is such a privilege to be able to have a voice right now. Wow, I must say something important. Well, one thing I tried to allow myself this time is to try not to put on a show, try not to be so, trying to make a 15 second reel just talk long form baby now i could share some spicy stories about recent experiences with women would you like to hear about that the thai girls oh, my girlfriend experiences here let's just say i had a friend right he was telling me about his experience with a girl one day he never had this because he grew up a little bit shy a little bit emasculated he didn't have a big wee wee and he got made fun of it when he was a kid and the society he grew up in seemed to emasculate his type of people, you know, casting them as nerdy mathematicians, computer nerds. He never saw someone that looked like him get the girl growing up. This shaped his early childhood experience his and perception of himself, even to this day, where he is a handsome guy, and he's now amongst his people, at least racially looking. He doesn't feel like a minority. He actually feels like, looks like some sort of celebrity when he walks around. Except for his dark skin, he notices he gets judged. But there's something handsome about him, and he finds himself having very low self-confidence relative to some of these other nerdy Asian men around. In this moment, he's realizing it's because he has no financial stability. These nerdy Asian men may have some confidence because they know they can survive in this world. This kind of puffed up Asian guy, oh damn, I said Asian. Well, I gave away the race. I was trying to keep this more anonymous. So back to the girls. So this guy, right? Was with this girl and she was looking at his balls, Zach, from a different angle. And then she was like, hey, let me take a picture. And she was arranging it, his flaccid penis, in a way that looked, fu looked entertaining to her. And it was so funny to this guy because he's like, wow, this is what her life is like. She sees a lot of dicks every day. And she's found a little way to entertain herself he, she probably plays some game in her head where she looks where she's like thinks it's artistic or maybe it's a thing her taking dick pics of dicks so let's take a little further this asian guy found a way to make it in life by people pleasing in one way is through humor and also honoring the feminine and yes this girl was there to be give him to honor him but he felt like oh why is she being so she doesn't seem comfortable or she seems like she needs to be cheered up. That's what this guy felt. And he realized, wow, I don't need to, like, I don't need to please this woman. She's already here to please me. That's what he was thinking. And yet he felt this need to entertain her and make her laugh. So it's such an ingrained instinct of him in dealing with women. So then, I don't know, they start talking about something and he's like dancing around trying to get her to dance and then he sees her dress and he's like, I'm gonna put on your dress. Or she says, put on my dress. And then he's wearing her dress, dancing around the hotel room. And she's like laughing so hard and videoing on his phone, of course, and laughing. And then he finds that he really enjoys it, making people laugh. She was really laughing like to the point where she was like telling her, telling him her face hurt. So who's here to entertain who? What's happening here? And this guy, he's like, doesn't really, he's not attracted to, not, doesn't think he should be a woman, but he thinks it's fun to play with different roles, which is part of his MO. And I think it's part of 
releasing ourselves from our egoic attachments is to be able to play different roles because it helps us see that a lot of it is conditioned. It could be biologically and hormonally conditioned. And to define yourself by it is to kind of pull your consciousness into a form-based reality, which is necessary, but to, be, to overemphasize it means you get stuck and you suffer. So the whole point of the laughter and the comedy and the switching of roles is to help someone break free of this. But doesn't mean you have to be stuck in either one but there's a slight humor in the social inconvention of it especially the situation they were in so what this guy felt was that this woman young woman working in such an industry she actually is quite entitled and she not okay not entitled let's just say she feels he felt the effects of the feminist rising movement in this woman this entitlement. But let's just not say it's feminist. Maybe it's Instagram. Actually, let's just expand a little bit. Being here in Asia, he found a lot of these Asian women are very obsessed with their Instagrams and their looks. And all of them wear fake contacts. And many have plastic surgery. All to look cute. He tried to talk to two so far. So far, he wasn't confident enough to get a good response. But he's not giving up. Because he wants to meet a girl in a natural way, but not give too much effort like before. But I think he should listen to some real manly advice, which is to simply uh, learn to be a chick magnet. It seems like if you just make money, they, you can just get them to come to you. You don't have to try so hard to do this or that. And maybe this can help a young man out there, or a woman, or some tra I don't know who. But there are probably a lot of young men out there who can't get laid, and they live in the States, and they feel like it's such a big deal, and they need to do, you know, do all these things to, to get the girl. I'm just saying there are places, allegedly, this is for entertainment purposes only, there are places in the world you can go and meet beautiful young women who are eager to please you. You may just have to give them a certain number of flowers as a donation, and it's a beautiful thing. Especially when you feel like they actually have good energy. Because some of them are, are really not great in great situations. Some of them treat it like a business. And it is a business. The whole world is... If spirituality is commoditized, so can sexuality, obviously. If it's like the sexuality being commoditized, I think is much... Is it better? And spirituality being commoditized. I think in a way it could say you could say sexuality is more predictable. It's it's obvious, it's the oldest profession that's commoditized. But maybe spirituality too. It used to be religion, you have to give the money to the church and they promise you salvation. And these days it's you give your money to a life coach or some new age program, sacred sexuality, manifestation program, and you get it's like salvation. So what's there's nothing actually new. Well, this being played like strings, guitar strings for the same, for the same desires. All I know is I really want to have a home and a studio where I can ground in and work on something. This, uh, this moment, this podcast right now is an episode from uh, finally having some moment, of some sense of temporary confluence of powers coming together to allow me to be able to speak and be here and share these stories. I know it's not as good as I want it to be it's rambly i can hear the judgments but i think it's necessary to get out there something i can't explain it because if i try to explain it i feel like i twist it up by saying hey this is ego i want to leave a legacy just like everyone else i could say well it's natural human desire to share something from the heart from my own experience and maybe is everyone saying this like maybe my own experience can help someone or is it like what the marketers say you got to tell people look i'm here to save you time and you got to really believe it and yet i'm reluctant to ever say that about anything even if i did believe it it just feels like you're trying to manipulate people why not just speak your own truth if people resonate they do if they don't they don't you don't have to shove it in their face it's, they're here voluntarily so let's say you're here voluntarily listening now. And that means it's time for you to step into your hero. Oh my God. It must, it's, it's a time to make a change. Now it's time for me to plug something. To say, hey, check out my program on being 
blah, blah, blah. I need to find, I'm not here to make money, am I? I'd like this podcast and everything I put out, like, feels very authentic just to be for what it is. No courses. So I just gotta find a way to get more stable financially and on this earth. And then I can do these kind of things. Sort of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You take care of your basic survival, then you can talk more about self-realization at, or have loving connections and relations with others. It's hard if you're just trying to figure out how to breathe. So here's to fresh air and that might be a way to make money. Focus on helping people breathe better. I think the future, like this nice city, every you can get everything, it's convenient. But the air fucking sucks. It's so polluted. I don't, I don't understand. Like people don't even f- understand how polluted it is, and how fresh, great air actually gives you amazing energy. Not wearing that Prada, but that's what I see behind the eyes of some of these dolled up women. There's something. There's a, there's a sickness behind there. Maybe it's if their contacts are just irritating them. So the key is to find someone who's very, who can be innocent and playful, and yet kinky because that means they didn't lose themselves in the kinkiness and by kinky i mean things that tempt Alrighty then thank you for listening if you're even listening i hope that you see something see here again this is like disempowered speech i hope that you enjoyed this if you want to speak like those manly guys you got to be like look look here's what you got to do you got to look at yourself and say this is healing and this is spirituality And if you try to be a spiritual healer, you're convoluting things. If you really want to be enlightened, if you really want to get out of this circle, this rat race, this cycle of trying to do the best and you did everything you're supposed to do and it didn't work and why you still feel empty? Because emptiness is who you are. The zero. Can we come back to being a zero instead of being a hero? Can we see spirituality as making us less of a person? Less of some narcissistic, idealized version of ourselves, but simply to release the ego, to dissolve, and let it stay dissolved and be in our awareness and watch our ego personality for survival, the resistance, the denial. You know, it's easy to call someone like me a psychopath or crazy because the ego doesn't want to let go and i'm saying hey let's let it go and come back to pure simple consciousness awareness that everyone always talks about but if your ego is like i am awareness it's it's a layer of something on top and then you come back to your innocence we come back to our innocence when we look out into the world with no attachment to how it should or shouldn't be and this is the balance you're not a newborn child but you can have that quality the less you're attached, you can still be like, this is what I need to do and don't step on my toes. But to be able to step out of that in your moments of, you know, freedom from it, that's how I see it. It's not any less spiritual in a city than it is in a spiritual community. That's all I'm saying. Except in a spiritual community, you get, you feel more primal. And why I say that is because I'm referring to some jungle. Uh, okay, guys. Lost. Lost. There's no need to be found. Peace. Peace, peace, peace. Be with you.